Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. Welcome to Prototyping Sonic Institutions with Black Swan. My name is Ali Zhang, uh, they, them. I am one of the discourse curators here at CTM. Um, yeah, I'm really excited for the session today because um, we've got a bit of a, an unusual project. Um, we're working on a slightly longer term collaboration with Black Swan for this year's edition of Rethinking Music Ecosystems. Uh, which is a series that we started a few years ago, considering the current state of music making, sharing, cultural production a bit more broadly. Um, and it's taken a bit more of an active turn in the past few years, which I'm really excited about. So last year we invited a few people to facilitate workshops and discussions. Um, and then they reflected on the, those workshops um, with some writing on our website, on our magazine. Um, and this year we're conducting a bit more involved, a bit more involved in a more practical project, um, which is going to see us working for, um, you know, over the span of a year or so uh, with Black Swan. Um, so today Black Swan will be giving a presentation about what they do, followed by a little discussion with me, and then we'll open up for audience Q&As at the end. So yeah, please feel free to send us any questions in the YouTube chat or the Black, cha uh, Black Swan channel in Discord. Um, we'll, we'll be monitoring both. Um, and just a heads up that we'll be archiving the questions from YouTube in the Discord as well, that we won't be posting anybody's usernames or anything, um, just because that's a kind of useful archive to have in this kind of longer term experimental project. Um, so yeah, today we have with us from Black Swan, Penny Rafferty, Laura Lottie, Callum Bowden, and Leith Binketa. Um, thanks for being with us today um, and welcome. I'll pass it on thanks to you. Thanks so much, Ollie. And uh, yeah, super excited to be here and to be engaged in this year long experiment into rethinking how resources can be distributed within um, a more music focused cultural scene. And um, so, Black Swan was established in 2018. We're a collective of researchers, artists, designers, and technologists based in Berlin. And we use blockchain thinking, which means um, using the operational and effective affordances of blockchain without relying on the technology itself. And this is to pursue alternative approaches to the traditional art world templates for art making. And um, so far, our research has kind of been more focused on the contemporary art world and the failures of the existing institutions that make up the contemporary art world to meet the needs of artists and to kind of provide them with uh, secure livelihoods. And, um, and now with CTM, we're excited to think more about, uh, yeah, music focus and, and sonic institutions more generally and how Bl Black Swan's research um, could apply to this context. And so Black Swan works to put resources into the hands of the users rather than the gatekeepers of culture. Um, our model originates from this uh, foundational separation between decision-making and resource contribution. And so what this means is that um, in our model, Cultural institutions, uh, whether it's galleries, museums, funding bodies, uh, recording studios, record labels, would have no influence over how their resources or funds are used. And in our model, all decisions are made by um, the artists and the cultural practitioners. So we un we've al always understood this, um, this goal as quite, uh, big to try and start addressing, like how do you build more sustainable art worlds, cultural worlds that work for creative practitioners. And we've always wanted to start from existing communities of creative practitioners. And so we've kind of over time developed a methodology that puts play at the center of technical development. Uh, blockchain is still a very new and early technology. Um, and as we've seen over the last year, there are a lot of discussions around um, the morality of engaging with this type of technology, or there's a lot of different ideas around what it is and how it should be used. And we've always wanted to push back against the 
Silicon Valley or the tech industry model, which often finds um, solutions that then they retrofit onto social groups and have always wanted to start with communities of creative practitioners to try to understand uh, both what are behaviors that cur currently exist and could be supported by a technology and also what happens when uh, groups start thinking with or using a technology, what do we learn about the emotional affordances of working with a set tool. And so over the last year, we set up a series of uh, role playing games, working groups and hackathons um, as an attempt to challenge the mystique surrounding blockchains, understand its emergent behaviors and um, and try and really break down like how do people feel when they use the stuff or work in these ways. And so I should also frame a bit that Black Swan comes out of um, thinking about decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs, which um, is this proposal for blockchain based organizations uh, where online communities have a shared bank account or a treasury that they're able to allocate um, through collective decision making processes. And so we became very interested in what happens when we think about the current cultural landscape through the lens of decentralized autonomous organizations without being limited by blockchain and its current articulations. And so um, we broke down a DAO to these three components that we wanted to investigate over 2021 with different groups of artists. And so the first one uh, was at Trust in Berlin and looked at decision making and we tested three different voting mechanics to understand what kind of worked best for allocating some funds in a intimate uh, setting. And then uh, in August at Kunstwerke Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin, we looked at organizational structures and modes of exchange to try and understand what happens when we ask creative practitioners to adopt certain um, hierarchies or ways of working together. What do we learn about these structures? What are the limits of a kind of calcified or um, stagnant organizational structure? And then finally, um, at the Van Abe Museum, more recently, we looked at values and the ontologies of value that are um, created and constructed through artistic practice to try and um, understand how we might begin to think value beyond narrow and reductive market forms of value. And so the, uh, the first um, outcome of this uh, methodology is Signet, which is a consensus building tool for artists. So as you can see, Signet is a web prototype for a quadratic voting application. And quadratic voting enables a more nuanced way of expressing preferences than one token, one vote, which is the dominant decision making mechanisms in the majority of DAOs and blockchain applications. So the way in which quadratic voting works is that everyone has the same number of voice credits that they can use to allocate across proposals, but it is exponentially more expensive to express a higher preference. So expressing a strong vote for a proposal would cost exponentially more voice credits. So Signet is designed to make the relation between voice credits and effective votes clear to understand visually. Um, participants in Signet uh, can uh, uh, make proposals uh, and uh, vote on them. And voting is organized around the moon cycle with the proposal window opening on the new moon, a uh, moment to set intention um, and lasting the, the full cycle. Um, we wanted to move away from the bureaucratic uh, regime of days uh, and weeks uh, and instead uh, um, create a system that would uh, enable the participants to um, inhabit the uh, different temporalities and remain connected to um, yeah, more than human um, cycles. Um, so Signet was developed during the first uh, uh, working group at Trust. Um, and um, since then, as Callum was saying, we've tested it at Kunstwerke in Berlin, um, where we ran a 36 hour long role played hackathon that was then followed by a uh, full voting cycle in Signet in which participants could propose uh, um, certain projects uh, that would use uh, the resources uh, that they gathered uh, during the event. 
Um, now, with regard to our next steps, uh, um, first of all, uh, one of our goals is to run uh, more um, tests and experiments with signets and keep gathering feedbacks uh, from the participants uh, and enable communities to begin using it um, on their own. And um, also using uh, these learnings and insights uh, uh, to develop signet into a fully fledged uh, DAO. And you can see here the modules that were identified that uh, would enable Signet to, um, or the Black Swan ecosystem to, to really expand beyond the um, decision making itself. Um, and then, uh, yeah, among our, our next steps, we also still have like uh, uh, certain uh, open questions, uh, particularly with regard to onboarding and um, uh, ownership structures. But um, yeah, as part of this, uh, as part of the, uh, our goal for this year is also to, uh, to answer them and um, also, um, yeah, activate uh, more the translocal dimension of uh, our collaboration that Signet uh, makes possible. Um, now, so um, as we are moving towards uh, concretizing these insights and learnings from the past year into uh, these tools, uh, um, in the next, uh, in the remainder of this presentation, we wanted to share uh, some of the evaluations that we have come to um, in this year in the form of uh, affirmations for art worlds uh, based on uh, solidarity and mutualism. And the first uh, um, is... Uh, Art making is a mode of collective staking. And now I'm gonna explain it. Um, so an agreement uh, is uh, always a commitment uh, before, um, even before a formal contract. And so DAOs and blockchains uh, have or provide mechanisms that make these commitments uh, more explicit. And one of these mechanisms is uh, staking, which is uh, in blockchain uh, terms, uh, the practice of uh, locking tokens uh, into protocol to earn some kind of reward uh, while uh, giving away the possibility of uh, trading these tokens. In short, a stake or a staking is like a lock on liquidity that enables the circulation of uh, other values within a system. And uh, Taking as a practice and as a mode of relating to one another extends uh, well beyond blockchain. Collective practices uh, uh, show that we are always at stake with each other, socially and often economically. Um, in fact, the staking can take many different forms. Uh, one can stake in an idea or a project or a practice, uh, or it could be a way to assign responsibility or signal appreciation. Um, so in a sense, staking really creates connections and networks. Uh, and uh, um, it's a um, game that uh, keeps growing and, and making its own rules as more uh, people play it. Um, and uh, this is true for um, the art world too. Um, in a way, the myth of the individual artist uh, uh, is a fantasy from a, a bygone era. And um, art making uh, um, and surely music making as well has always been a, a form of collective staking. And even today, an artist CV, which is a highly disputed tool in the arts uh, tells a story of collaboration with many different kinds of stakeholders uh, from studio assistants and curators to galleries collectors uh, universities uh, residency programs uh, and so on um, so while our collectives uh, have long been part of uh, our history books uh, with the recuperation and individualization of the collective by the art market uh, there is an urgent need for alternative organizational structures and mechanisms uh, that can support the heterogeneity of contributions into creative processes and tend to the ecologies within which these collectives are situated so Black Swan uses blockchains to support and make explicit the commitments and trust networks that already exist among practitioners without eliminating them or replacing them with code. And it also aims to build new bridges to extend this trust to institutional actors that can participate as silent stakeholders. So the challenge uh, is how uh, to not constrain these uh, nascent collective formations with too much formalization, since um, emotional engagement is uh, as important as protocol mechanics um, in running an organization. Oops. 
Second affirmation being the organization is united through shared vibes, collective crafts, and hold their own mini worlds in common. So what's being held in common by an organization or like a social group is most likely a sum of individual contributions, both generated and channeled via all kind of collective rituals, encounters, and we can see art making as being one of those. Um, that's not something you can really come up with or set the terms off in advance. We can eventually create the conditions to facilitate or stimulate the creation of shared vibes, but you can't astroturf or engineer it. One contribution to the creation of shared vibes or a shared vibe is most likely essential to a process of self-identification. In other terms, you can jump in the wagon, but you can't really predefine its destination. Shared vibes are made of or built upon a common history, a running gag, a worldview, a sense of taste, or anything that's generated by the group through mutual interaction, and which on the long run contributes to a sense of shared experience or belonging. Legible to the outside or not, the expression of shared vibes, as Ezra Koenig puts it, has the ability to evoke using a small number of disparate elements, a certain time, place, and milieu, nexus of historic, geographic, and cultural forces. Putting aside the task or the exercise of defining a vibe, we can imagine that caring for it can be considered as a organizing principle for mutualistic art organization. Thanks to the internet and the affordances of certain online platforms, vibes can be another term to describe the aesthetic manifestation of what some would call digital localities, which are basically formed around shared interests discourse or else, and which transcend geographical constraints or cultural context. Looking at Black Swan's experiments around moon cycles and signets, we could look at it or consider it as a base layer or a potential ground for the development of a more equitable common substrate for art making. The organization is maintained. Um, this affirmation looks at uh, how new art ecologies need to be cared for, curated, and tended to. And um, this affirmation is also about pushing back against the notion of autonomy embedded with, within ideas about blockchain-based DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, whether supported by technology or not, an organization is only successful over an extended period of time if it's constantly maintained. Maintenance is about repair and renewal. Um, it's about putting focus onto the social and technical mechanisms that allow, allow a social group to operate in, and exist in the first place. Um, maintenance also enables uh, a group, a social formation, an organization to be in flux and to adapt to its milieu or social context. Um, a decentralized autonomous organization, like any operational framework, is just a funnel to attract and capture common will or shared vibes. Um, and social dynamics are more important than hard and software. The projects emerging out of the blockchain industry today are um, quite limited in the imagination that they pull from. Uh, they're not radically different uh, in the future that they project or uh, try to realize and often end up falling back on corporate models of social relation. Um, and Black Swan sees part of the problem with DAOs um, in the confusion around the meaning of decentralization. There's a misguided emph emphasis on eliminating um, hierarchies and eliminating the social, um, while the other part of the problem with DAOs that we see is the lack of curation in the original sense of the word, um, a lack of actual care for the social relations that DAOs engender or facilitate. And with Black Swan, we are trying to address this by um, kind of thinking back to the, the original meaning of curation and, um, and the kind of root curare, which means to take care or to cure. Um, curating as taking care of bathhouses in uh, ancient Roman times, 
uh, curating as the priest who cared for souls in the medieval era to looking at collections or to looking after collections of art and artifacts in the 18th century. Um, what kind of new inflections or metamorphosis can be found in the meaning and practice of curation as it's focused on and within uh, distributed digital environments. Um, our research and the working groups that we've facilitated over the last year have really um, demonstrated the ways in which community facilitation and maintenance is a key capacity needed by any institution, but especially cultural institutions in the future. And this facilitation needs to be embedded within the core organizing principles of a organization um, and cultivated within its daily practice. This is especially important when trying to get uh, participation within decision-making processes. Uh, these things don't just happen on their own and it's important to think about ways of creating energy around something and to, to support participation and to facilitate participation. And so Black Swan's research uh, is demystifying the idea of the decentralized autonomous organization. Decentralization as a technical principle is important in fostering um, infrastructural resilience or being censorship resistant, but at the end of the day, when bringing this technical concept to the social, it can't be about eliminating hierarchies. Instead, it should be about creating and supporting useful hierarchies, uh, mutable organizational structures in order to redistribute power. Autonomy is always a mix of automation and labor. The labor of care for the infrastructures that enable humans to work together and humans and machines to work together. And organizing is always a mix of horizontal, vertical, and transversal strategies. Hello. Um, so I want to talk a little bit to the idea of the organization is mutable and liable to change. And since the original formulation in around 2016 of the philosophy of DAOs, they've really kind of promised to enable a new form of coordination between people, resources, and communities locally and translocally, facilitating digital assets, decisions, ideas, and mutable frameworks with the potential of permanent and transparent records of all decisions made if the users decide that's um, important for their group. Now, perhaps it is this very kind of um, mutability of like what form a DAO can take and the capacity for it to change and test rules for organizing at a very basic level and to understand that there's no solution, only a move towards it. In a sense, a kind of endless state of solution becomings. And um, because for those of you who may not be aware, the kind of framework of a DAO is that it has the potential um, to change the rules and formations that govern it, depending on what the users wish. So you can actually put in proposals to change the very foundations of the structures. And in a sense, I think like that's very much the kind of underpinnings of why DAOs are so interesting because they sort of envisage this utopia as quite mutable and that organization should be in flux, allowing for affordances of different modes of organization and desirable hierarchies, which has inspired, of course, this very intense imagineering and experimental collaborations, not just in the frame of Black Swan, but between a lot of artists and technologists who've provoked and realized designs for new architectures of power and distribution that can metamorphosize at the will of their members. But maybe just to speak a bit um, more towards Black Swan in terms of this structure. 
I want to kind of zoom in a little bit maybe to the history um, and unpack a few things that have already been mentioned, but in the terms of this mutable position. So at the base level of the way in which Black Swan has prototyped itself starting around 2018 was this essayistic structure called a speculative white paper, which was commissioned by Kunstwerker. And from this blueprint being published, a group of practitioners formed around it who spoke through meetings to kind of speed run the organizations at strategies and demarcation points from this genesis point of the Black Swan DAO. Because of course, being a DAO, as soon as it's launched, all the parameters of its organization can be changed depending on its user's desire. And so starting almost as in like a conversation on prototype, which resonated through a whole group of practitioners that came together to talk through this DAO or proposal of a DAO. So they were artists, programmers, curators, critics in the art scene of Berlin. And together we sort of set this framework, which were mapped out um, because after of course, many long conversations, which I think Ellen was also hinting to just then that, you know, we believe that even decentralized experiments of today, there need to be this kind of foundational modes of guidance and social contracts and codes of conducts and evaluation frameworks to even begin to be able to organize within a decentralized way. And from this point, we then began to center role play at the core of this methodology. So taking this kind of conversational structuring and mapping and then utilizing role play as a method for exploring the kind of usability um, and the sort of socio, but also emotional political register of the user experience. And there is this sort of saying in gaming culture that if only more world problems could be played out in game worlds with the ability to restart, we would find solutions a lot quicker. And I think in a sense, this is what role play allowed us to do. And we'll continue to do that as we build up through this kind of open source mutable toolkit surrounding Black Swan. There has been not only spoken about, but also tested by its uh, community of users before being implemented. And that actually brings me on to what we're doing here, um, into the next part of Black Swan's phase in prototyping these sonic institutions with CTM. So, for this edition, Rethinking the Music Ecosystems Program, um, we very happily um, took up the invitation from CTM to concoct another participatory experiment, which builds on those models of conversation and those models of role play. But this time we've decided to extend it to the music community. And we wish to employ decentralized autonomous organizational infrastructure and thought in a bid to realize hopefully new ways of creating work. So we'll be working with a number of resource pledged silent stakeholders, which maybe is kind of important to explain a little bit because in a way DAOs, there's like thousands of DAOs that are utilizing different systems. And the way Black Swan works is maybe a little different to how normal DAOs work because normally a DAO group, the users would actually also be the stakeholders. And so they would utilize their collective resources. But because of the way Black Swan was forecasted to try to create um, different models of resource allocation in a ecosystem that was local to Berlin, but also of course facing a lot of problems that you find all across the world, whether that be in the arts or music, but this kind of impending um, gentrification discrepancies in the way resources are allocated, whether that be through gender, class, or race, 
And so actually the way that Black Swan functions is that our resources are pledged by cultural institutions and facilitators and resource holders. And they don't actually get to decide how those resources are allocated to the group. Um, this is done by the cultural practitioners. So we kind of have like two groups, whereas maybe more typically you would have one uh, in terms of a more linear version of a DAO. But maybe we'll unpack this a little bit later on more deeply if that's not um, coherent. Please just drop in the Q&A. And uh, using this collective digital toolkit, um, we hope to place our quadratic voting application known as Signet, which Laura um, nicely introduced, um, where actually the participants of this new version of the CTM will collectively decide how to disseminate and allocate the resources pledged to the project. And the concept that drives Black Swan, of course, is still rooted in this open source interdependency of collaborative institutional formations and intersectional access. And so far, we've typically done a lot of our research in the fine art world, or at least like a hybrid of arts and tech. And so we're very interested to be able to bring that more into this year long experiment uh, within sonic infrastructures set within the local city and still of Berlin, but participants will be selected via an open call. And the number actually will depend on the final pledge by the silent stakeholders, which will open on the 24th of May, uh, which coincides with part two of CTM. And we hope that this next part of our research will extend towards the final formation of Black Swan, which will go live in autumn this year. And of course, in this sense, we're also extending the research with the help of CTM and also the participants um, towards sonic productions and hybrid forms of sound and art making. Um, and so, yeah, together with the group, we will hope to explore and challenge conventional decision-making and resource allocation models in the arts and cultural sectors. And Black Swan will facilitate a workshop, um, which we will unpack um, the development of how these new artist-led models of communal support, collaboration and governance, specifically through the people who actually end up with the resources. And from that workshop, we will then have these kind of um, check-ins throughout the year. We'll have the proposals, Signet will be used, and then the successful application will be announced. And then there's uh, till the end of 2022 for those participants to utilize their resources. Um, hopefully, that at least gave you a little bit of a taster of what we aim to unpack um, for the next 30, 40 minutes. And yeah, Oli, is there anything that we missed that you feel like needs uh, urgently addressed? Um, <laughs> not right away. There's a lot of questions I have though. It's always really nice. Um, hearing how the project evolves because every time you guys speak about it there's always new additions and new thoughts and new questions and whatever so that's really nice thank you um so yeah we'll chat for the next like 25 30 minutes or so but um if people do have questions at any point please do feel free to pop them in the chat um to start off i think um one of my first questions would be around the role of um, blockchain technology in the project. And I wonder how central you feel like it needs to be to how the project is presented to people. Uh, so for instance, something I always kind of wonder about is like, 
you know, when people use a centralized service, whether that's SoundCloud or Facebook or whatever, people aren't really logging in thinking like, oh, I'm just going to use this architecturally or politically centralized platform. They're thinking more about its function or its social connotations or something like that. Um, and yeah, so maybe they're thinking more about the ends they're using it for. And so I wonder, like, how central do you think um, the question of blockchain and the tech side of it is to um, people actually engaging with it? Um, does anyone want to start us off with that? I have um, some thoughts. So something that I always think about is the cybernetician Stafford Beer's provocation that the purpose of a system is what it does. And I think um, especially with technology, it's shrouded in like jargon and complicated um, technical metaphors that make it hard for people to actually like understand what it does. Um, I think in the case of like Web2, this is definitely happening where um, projects like the declared value of a technology, um, like open access to information or like indexing the web or creating a, a platform for creators where the, the people producing and doing work for the platform are ultimately just being turned into the product that's sold to advertisers. Like that is what the, the web two systems are doing as I think like people are aware of now. And so I think that it's important for um, politics to extend not only to like the surface of something or to the declared values of something, but also to like the effects and um, the externalities of of these of our technically mediated world and so um, that's not really answering whether blockchain is important blockchain like also is going through like there are so many examples of uh, left washing or community washing of blockchain technology also um, so I think it's more for me about um, tying technical development to certain communities and to specific niches and specific contexts to relink the technical to the social and the political um, to try and develop platforms that are managed by these social contexts so that they can reflect a diversity of values so it's no longer about um, universal te technological platforms or the like like a totalizing technology, but rather we're bifurcating technology into a multiplicity of value systems, worldviews, uh, cosmologies. And so for me, that's more important than blockchain itself. Like blockchain or peer-to-peer -peer technology provides different models for approaching the creation of um, basically just like data storage systems that um, resist the concentration of power within a certain server. And I think that that for me is like the most exciting part of, of blockchain or peer-to-peer or -peer technology more generally or distributed ledger technology. But with Black Swan, I don't think we're like tied to any particular technology. It's more using blockchain as like a catalyst for rethinking the way that like we socially organize around technology. Thanks. Does anybody want to add to that at all? Um, if not, I'll carry on from that, because um, I would like to ask a bit more about this kind of role playing process um, that you've been working with um, in, instead of actually working with the technology itself, but kind of LARPing or acting out what that talk, how that technology would actually work in these contexts. Um, so could you maybe speak a bit about how um, how your thinking around the technology has changed through those experiments um, and that role playing and that um, in that process, like how does it change the potential kind of design or governance choices that you might make? Laura, do you maybe want to start us off on that? Sure. Um, yeah. Well, I think one of the 
one of the big learnings uh, out of these experiments and role plays, uh, um, I think is something that Callum mentioned before, which is uh, the key um, importance of uh, curation and uh, caring for the relations and facilitating these relations, particularly as uh, um, as a as a, an ecosystem is still in this uh, um, nascent uh, um, phase. So again, yeah, demystifying uh, really the um, the concept uh, or the way in which like this, the the idea of decentralization is understood to really emphasize more the necessity of uh, uh, facilitation, particularly in the context of the digital communities. Um, that becomes really, um, yeah, really important. And um, yeah, I guess another aspect, uh, um, one of the, I guess the initial big learnings that came out of the first uh, uh, working group at Trust, uh, which uh, then led to, um, to the creation of Signet, uh, um, is uh, the fact that it seems like quadratic voting uh, is a, is a is a method or like a, me a voting mechanism that um, it seems that, that people find uh, um, I guess uh, um, fair perhaps uh, or like more. Um, interesting uh, to use and appropriate to use uh, than uh, more um, traditional, I guess, uh, emoji vote uh, or lottery vote, which were other um, voting mechanisms that we tested within that working group. Uh, so uh, definitely that was, uh, um, yeah, a really big, uh, uh, a really big learning. Our initial, um, I guess, hypothesis was that it was going to be too complex uh, to um, to understand because it's like relatively elaborate. But yeah, through the feedbacks, uh, um, it was really clear that um, yeah, that instead uh, it's it seems like it it, it worked well, like uh, not just uh, from a technical uh, standpoint, but more the uh, at a level of like emotional or affective response. And maybe I just follow up with, uh, or alongside that, in, I think also like this methodology of using role play, um, it also very much allows the users to perform actions and decisions that are maybe more common when we're like faced with the situation IRL. But if you had like a kind of workshop um, that was exploring these notions of like competition, scarcity, like this is also kind of a place where at times you might feel judged if you don't choose the kind of leftist collective position, but allowing this role play insignia then nobody necessarily knows if you are making those decisions or choices or bringing up those conversations because that's indefinitely what you want or ascribe to or whether you're just testing mechanics from which way they could swing. And I think this kind of allowed us to maybe manifest the more uncomfortable parts of like working and facilitation without having to kind of harbor the personal harm that that could do or the judgment that that could bring um, from the rest of the group. And I think that's, you know, that's also something that's so unique about um, art in general or music that there's a place or a time that you can like pause and really look into some of the most kind of traumatic or difficult parts of your psychosphere um, while still having kind of distance and the ability to transform that. Um, so I think that was like also really, for, or for me anyway, quite a powerful way to move through these kind of testing systems. Yeah, for sure. I imagine the kind of effect that these experiments has on one's subjectivity are also really important, as Callum mentioned before, you know, it's not just infrastructural, but it's also, it's cosmological, it's social, um, and all of that. Um, 
I guess my next question um, kind of has to do with the question of locality. So say your experiments so far have been pretty Berlin focused as is um, our work together. Um, but I think Laura, you mentioned that um, something you'd like to explore a lot more is the kind of translocal affordances of blockchain tech um, and these ways of thinking more broadly. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to um, uh, maybe more speculatively how you think that might play out or what you think is um, interesting or necessary about um, the translocal dimension of things. Yeah, in our early evaluation of the blockchains, uh, um, it became really clear that while on the one hand, I guess the infrastructure is still somewhat limited and expensive and financialized to an extent, uh, um, something really valuable and really, really important is the possibility to uh, transfer transmit uh, um, value at a distance across uh, uh, borders uh, in a way that is a lot more smooth and straightforward than uh, as if we had to do it like uh, um, you know through traditional legacy institutions uh, so that i think remains uh, like a really uh, yeah like a an affordance of, of blockchain that and DAOs in particular that i think we all um yeah I still think it's uh, um, it's really valuable, and um, while yeah, we don't have a concrete plans as well, like really focused on the um, yeah, like uh, the locality of Berlin to begin with. I think uh, I mean there's a. Uh, um, one of the possible uh, scenarios that we would like to see realized is that uh, different localities in different countries or, or jurisdictions or, or um, yeah, places uh, could, uh, through tools uh, such as Signet, uh, begin collaborating with each other at a distance. So um, I guess the idea of, of scaling here takes on like a different kind of shape so it's not a gigantic mega structure that uh, you know homogenizes everything uh, under its own uh, mechanisms but it's very much about enabling different localities to begin encountering and collaborating with the other localities uh, um yeah in a lot in a more distributed way yeah, something that I could add to that, and speaking of the translocal affordances of blockchain is that, I mean, you can kind of notice it over the last few years. I mean, I guess the pandemic kind of accelerated that, but like community formation happens less and less IRL, right? There's like less and less spaces for people to actually come together. Um, and something that I like to think of is that I probably have more in common with like a early 20s girl from the Midwest than my neighbor living downstairs. Um, so I guess when we speak to that and just like the overall idea of identity formation, I think that there's actually indeed like value in exploring mechanisms that allow people coming from different spaces to actually coordinate or collaborate. Cause yeah, you could just witness that, yeah, IRL, um, like organizing IRL has just been yeah happening less and less due to what I just mentioned earlier. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, it's a really interesting to think about how like the idea of what a milieu is, is kind of, you know, changing nowadays um, with all of these kind of, you know, broader um, political changes and all of that. Um, I wonder, maybe Leith, if you would uh, be able to kind of expand upon maybe some of the challenges that you've witnessed or also learnings um, that you found in kind of being more involved in these online communities. Say, I know you're quite involved with them. Uh, new models and how their kind of discord and online community is evolving or maybe Callum if you can also speak to that um, as well. Um, can you iterate the question or do you have like a precise kind of <laughs> yeah sorry focus? that was very precise was it um, yeah just I guess in the you know the past um, you know half a year a year or so of watching these online communities change and being part of changing that infrastructure as well um, if you could speak to speak about what has been challenging about them or what you've been surprised to learn in that process I mean yeah referring to once again the idea that I probably have more in common uh, with the 20 years old girl from the Midwest and my neighbor I think just like uh, existing within the spaces kind of like showed me that I just became really close with people with whom you could think that I just like have nothing in common to start with um, 
once again, it it's been very contextual, right? Like most of it happened in a time where you just couldn't leave your house and somehow you always need to be with other people, right? You don't really exist alone. So I was quite thankful to find the spaces and also just to see what actually came out of it. There was like multiple group projects, online platforms and whatnot that emerged from there. And at a pace that is actually, or that I could see as like very much unprecedented for someone who kind of like went through multi like multiple cultural institutions um, throughout my studies and whatnot. So challenges, I wouldn't be able to exactly pin them because like most of those spaces do not necessarily revolve around resource distribution and whatnot. Like, like there's different models for communities, right? And like some of the online communities are part of aren't necessarily DAOs in these. Um, or I'm also part of spaces in line with the idea of a DAO, but definitely less involved. Could it be more like um, practically or emotionally? So yeah, I could actually speak more about yeah the benefits or the kind of joy of being part of those spaces more than the challenges for now. Uh, but I guess that they'll kind of just like unravel themselves uh, through time. I think mean, to add to that, um, something like an insight that comes out of trust and some of the experiments that we did around like creating opportunities for self-organization um, that weren't very facilitated is like people didn't really respond to that. Like we had an event stream that anybody could sign up to do, but we found that people weren't signing up to do the event, uh, even if even though it was paid. And so like this maybe points to an assumption or just like a very specific um, claim or like base assumption of decentralized autonomous organizations which is that like people don't want to spend their life in like voting <laughs> it's really basic or like you know this idea of autonomous or self-emergent organization is a myth and um and basing any kind of community more generally or like social formation on like bureaucratic decision-making processes is not gonna attract uh, it's, it's not accessible. It's not going to attract a very wide uh, portion of the population because it's like a very specific thing to be interested in. And so, um, while at the same time at Trust, like we we do want to increase participation in core decision making, and like we do believe that deconcentrating power is um, really important. And so how do you design something? How do you design uh, modes of input or how do you facilitate moments of coming together that have other purposes than bureaucratic decision-making but also might lead to a decision? So like, how do you fold these things together so that it's more enjoyable and fun and like not the focus of a, yeah, of a social interaction? And just to add, speaking of challenges, and once again, I don't think like all questions are necessarily formulated or that there's actually any answer to them, um, but I can kind of see uh, the challenges when some of those communities based around, once again, shared interests will actually try to formalize as organizations indeed, which will um, basically involve the implementation of democratic processes and whatnot, as Callum was mentioning. And I think there will be a, yeah, it's going to be an interesting moment to see how, because bureaucracy, I believe, can also, sorry for the term, but just fuck up the vibe as well. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious to see how these spaces are going to negotiate like a potential transition um, from a more informal space to an actual like legal entity or organization or a DAO. Indeed. Yeah, for sure. That's all such tricky territory to navigate. Um, before we move to the audience q and I want to jump back to this question of scale um, that I think Laura brought up. Um, I think that really resonates with what um, I think Penny said earlier about, um, you know, Black Swan's proposition not being a solution to anything, but, you know, a constant process of becoming of constant iteration um, and whatnot. So um, I'm wondering if you could speak a bit about what you see um, as the kind of objectives and outcomes of Black Swan. Um, of course, you know, uh, decentralizing power is really um, central here. 
Um, and I guess, Laura, you've already um, kind of said that, you know, the aim is not to scale and become, you know, the um, dominant, um, a new homogenous model or anything throughout cultural ecosystems. Um, but yeah, so do you see the kind of um, the place that you're kind of working towards to be um, more closely linked to like not um, to knowledge production or, you know, is it to kind of uh, help spur on, you know, a lot more experiments in this arena um, or, you know, is it's not to create like the definitive model. So could you speak a bit more about like what you hope uh, Black Swan's experiments um, might catalyze? Maybe I can respond first though, and then you can go. Um, so I think like a lot of um, what Black Swan will hopefully eventually be is one of many systems, but potentially what Black Swan's role could be is actually about a, like a reflective system for other systems. Um, I think quite a bit about like um, Sarah Ahmed's idea of like queer ph phenomenology. And sometimes I'm thinking about Black Swan as like the desire path, um, like the way where you get this kind of um, foot marks across um, a grassy ravine where you could like, where people have just avoided to walk on the footpath. And like, I think it often feels a bit like this, that um, we're kind of taking a shortcut um, between the institutions um, to kind of create this proto institution. But like that, that shortcut is, yeah, maybe also as Lise was pointing out, um, at the moment, it's like without the kind of hangups of the bureaucracy. Um, even though I don't think that, um, it's unorganized, but it, it feels like at the moment we're in a really privileged position of basically being able to experiment without the weight that can come about when you start um, making a kind of organization that has to be held accountable um, to a kind of wider ecosystem and the choices that you've made. So I think, yeah, let's see sort of how, how that um, pans out in the future. And I think like the other thing that, um, like keeping with this Ahmed vein, but the other thing that I really see Black Swan speaking to is this like notion of the Killjoy, which is basically this idea of like um, to open up life or to like kind of make room for life with this possibility of chance and that like this experience of like being a problem or like running up against these structures that like kind of attempt to exclude you is sort of the starting point of a queer or feminist investigation into power and into hegemony and like what are the ways of disagreeing and how can kind of collective dynamics or structures or situations actually deal with disagreement, which I think is also something really interesting in terms of like collectivity or community. Um, and I think this is also sort of wraps into this um, online question a little while ago, but yeah, like how do we build like also through disagreement um, and how do those like disagreements are not necessarily binding, but can also be building structures. Um, yeah, I think I'm rambling enough now, but <laughs> like that's sort of um, how I feel Black Swan's like sort of methodology because I think also Black Swan doesn't necessarily want to take over the whole ecosystem and Black just wants to be part of it, like a sort of system of thresholds or gateways or something like this. Laura? Yeah, there's also something, oh yeah, I, I just wanted to add, there's also something like quite contradictory in the idea of scaling up a community, right? It's not something you necessarily want to do. So I guess there's like a 
potentially more interesting model where you can kind of like preserve certain like subcultures or niches and just have them interact with one another in communication with one another, which is somehow along the lines of some projects which are also being developed currently. But yeah, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, and I can just briefly add that, um, yeah, as as it's already been, been said, it's uh, um, we don't claim to have a solution or like a model to solve all, all kind of problems in the art world. But um, yeah, it's more about seeding uh, um, the some building blocks for um, different kinds of institutions, uh, different kinds of encounters, uh, like uh, uh, through the technology and also through the um, series of uh, working groups and role plays that, that we're doing. Um, and uh, I guess so far we've, we've been uh, testing uh, Signet and some of the mechanisms uh, they were working on with very different kinds of uh, communities uh, from uh, interdisciplinary researchers and practitioners uh, to more traditional artists, uh, uh, performing artists, uh, uh, soon uh, musicians. Uh, so it's, uh, um, yeah, it's very much about uh, um, creating some tools, so like modules uh, that can fit uh, and, and adapt uh, to what are the requirements of the uh, communities that ultimately are going to use them. Yeah. I wanted to oh, add one, um, sorry. Uh, like what has been interesting in the first uh, experiment we ran with Signet, this quadratic voting um, tool that we developed is that by opening up the idea creation and project development process for like a set number of resources, people end up thinking about how they can share that resource or how their ideas work together. And so it was kind of amazing that out of this first experiment, I think like all of the awarded projects except for one were collaborative and often um, like more than five people being involved in these projects, which obviously then does produce different types of organizational challenges. And we want to look at more like how do then these, these groups or like how do new groups work together? But um, it was kind of interesting to just see that, that by opening up these processes and creating opportunities for dialogue and for things in development to be exposed and communicated, um, people find ways of working together. Um, great, thanks everyone so much. Um, I think we can open up to audience questions now. Um, so again, yeah, feel free to send them in the YouTube chat or on Discord. Um, to start us off, we've got a, a question about blockchain. Um, so when using blockchain, do you have any ideas on how to decouple its use from the speculative aspect that seems inherent to the use of tokens um, and would maybe prevent people from using them for the functioning of a DAO? Uh, does anyone want to tackle that one? I can begin maybe. Um, so I guess, uh, as we were saying before, like, um, so far we've been a lot more interested in the cultural patterns uh, that blockchains and DAOs uh, kind of introduce or even reintroduce or uh, like bring uh, attention to that um, ultimately with the knowledge that the collective uh, um, behaviors and coordinations have been something that have uh, um, has existed forever basically so um so far with quadratic voting, uh, we are basically, with Signet, uh, we don't have a speculative token attached to it. So every participant uh, in a voting round will have the same number of voice credits uh, that then they can use uh, to allocate uh, to different proposals. Uh, and um, at every cycle, people will still have the, um, the same number of, uh, of voice credits. So I guess maybe that's a way to um, avoid the, the financial speculation that tokens are introducing or have, have introduced. Um, yeah, and 
I guess that's also like a bit of an open question for us, uh, like as we are uh, now starting to really build the, the other parts or other uh, modules in the infrastructure to decide whether that's something that's um, even useful. Although one question that remains uh, is uh, at the uh, the reliance on infrastructures that are, yes, financialized because they operate through tokens. So, so whether it's Ethereum or like a layer two, there is a tokenized component in there if, if um, yeah, if that's uh, um, the way in which Signet will exist on a blockchain. Also, though, I think um, just to maybe like answer the question in terms of what I've seen, some blockchain based projects do is like you can make non transferable tokens so um, like so you can limit the possibility that tokens can be traded and they could then just serve as a form of identity. Um, yeah so it, like a, a forced staking of tokens, where they're only ever tied to one wallet. Uh, just to tack on to that, I wonder if you've seen any ways of navigating the kind of financialized aspect of it in the block wider blockchain ecosystem that you feel like um, manages to, I don't know, subvert the financial financialization somehow or kind of use it in an unexpected or clever way? I was really interested um, when I learned about this project OneHive which um, is a group that develops like open source infrastructure for DAOs. Um, and they launched a token with a faucet that anybody within their wider community could claim at a set interval. So it wasn't like they did a launch where people who had enough money could have a lot of power within the or like often these tokens are used for decision making so it means that the people who have the most money end up having the most power to sway decisions and what was kind of interesting about this faucet model is that um it was kind of indiscriminately available to anybody who was participating in the community also different from other social token reward models where like there's some reductive quantification of contribution based on how many emojis you get or how often you post or something. And this was kind of like, anybody can get it. Um, you can only ever get so much at a time. And if you participate longer, then you can get more of it, which is kind of an interesting uh, model, I thought. Um, yeah, cool. Thank you for that. Um, Let's see. Um, I just have I have another question um, just regarding um, uh, this question of like a kind of gatekeeper um, idea um, and the idea that you're kind of shifting hierarchies, not necessarily dissolving them completely. Uh, and I wonder if to kind of play devil's advocate for a moment, if um, I don't know if you've maybe received this kind of feedback before or um, um, or if anybody feels like, you know, it's not, say, you know, you're not removing gatekeepers, but just kind of shifting them or allowing other people to kind of take on this kind of role. Um, and I can imagine some people finding that to be kind of problematic or kind of uh, conducive to the same kind of issues that you're trying to alleviate. Um, so I wonder if uh, you could speak to that. Maybe I could start with this one, because I think um... Obviously, that's typically a kind of immediate response, I would say, but um, I think also we tend to sometimes forget that having power, if it's executed in the right way, is also attached to empowerment. And that there's specific structures that can actually give strength um, to a landscape of activism or community building. And these come with, of course, like social contracts that determine like how you use and wield and also include 
people in these leadership roles. And I think also in terms of dissolvable hierarchies, that also means that other people take up different power positions. So not that like literally the power position dissolves, but that they're like on rotation almost. So like, you know, I mean, this is actually even how we have begun to practice Black Swan between us, that we will take on different roles per project. And so that it kind of gives everybody a chance to hold on to specific decisions or pattern making rather than like always having kind of one leadership role. And I think also this in terms um, of quite often the opposite uh, argument is that like, you know, these kind of plenum fatigue that occurs if you completely decentralize everything um, or, you know, then you're in meetings upon meetings upon meetings. And sometimes actually it's quite supportive if the right decisions are made in order to move swiftly um, and with forethought for the community. Um, Jaya Clara Brecker speaks beautifully to these ideas in terms of DAOs with affinity groups, which of course are, like um, radical left-wing organization platforms that particularly look to how power is distributed in order to keep the community and the affinity group safe and like how those kind of modules and nodes can actually mesh together to create like a larger landscape instead of having to have this um, total of either totally uh, unstructured or like a very rigid structure. Hopefully I kind of spoke to that a bit, but maybe other people would like to follow on in, in terms, I don't know, would that be interesting in terms of like what technology we use as well? Like in terms of the quadratic voting? Callum, do you wanna, you looked like you were gonna well, I was just going to um, jump on what you were saying in terms of like not like we don't think that all gatekeeping is bad, which is what Penny was saying. Um, but it's about increasing participation in gatekeeping and um, increasing the accountability of gatekeepers who uh, are kind of currently existing within the cultural landscape. Um, something that we've also looked at is the often huge discrepancies uh, between what the gatekeepers or the administrators or managers of the cultural industry earn as a wage and what artists earn as a wage. And if artists could take on some of the work of uh, these managers, there might be less of a like claim that this, these roles deserve this type of remuneration. So, which is a word I always say wrong, remuneration. Um, so I think it's like, we don't know exactly where our experiments will lead us, but and there are externalities and negative affordances to technologies that should be evaluated and incorporated into the designs as they emerge. And so I think it's, yeah, at the moment, just kind of like exploring what we learn when we open up decision-making processes around the allocation of cultural resources. What do we learn from that? What type of work is produced? Um, and then, yeah, we'll see from there. Also, just to <clears throat> echo what Callum just said, I think that gatekeeping doesn't always echo or means or imply oligarchy as well. I feel like it mostly depends on who actually sets up the term of that potential gatekeeping and if those terms are actually set up by the community itself. And going back to one of those information that the organization has to be maintained, it's actually a lot of work to take on administrative tasks. So at the end of the day, I feel like some people will always have to do this work, 
but the question is just like yeah to whom the process is actually open to and who can participate to yeah just setting up those terms yeah yeah, I think that's a great way of responding to that question. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate how you hi highlight, you know, just the importance of that kind of care and maintenance work um, that goes into any kind of um, cultural project. Um, well, we're kind of approaching the end of our session today. Um, so I just want to maybe reiterate for people who are interested in um, what the collaboration is going to look like and what the next steps are. I know Penny already walked us through part of it. Um, but yeah, I just want to say that, yeah, for people interested, please keep an eye out on our socials as well as our newsletter. Um, there will be an open call um, coming in the next couple months. Um, and uh, you can find in the chat um, a link to a bunch of um, a bunch more Black Swan info. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for spending some time on this Sunday afternoon. Um, with us. I really appreciate it um, and really excited to work with you all. Um, yeah, thanks everybody and thanks for tuning in today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.